I'd like to introduce first our moderator, Dr. Jeffrey Ram from Wayne State University. And uh, Jeff has a very interesting background because um, he uh, has worked um, uh, with invertebrate um, invasions in the Great Lakes. And um, he was president of the International Society for Inver Invertebrate Reproduction. And I didn't know that, but he works with between engineering and water quality and now in health. He's done a lot of a lot of work with source tracking and new methods. He's a professor of, of physiology, really, but he's in biochemistry, microbiology, and immunology at Wayne State University. And he gave me a quote, and I really like it, so I'm going to read it. Wastewater has enormous complexity and information about society and our environment. So, Jeff, I'm going to leave it to you to introduce the panel and take it away. Okay. Well, we've heard. Thank you for the introduction. That's great. Um, uh, we've heard a bit about the future of uh, wastewater epidemiology from John Person. And I think we all have lots of ideas about the things that he said and other ideas that we are thinking about for the future of wastewater uh, uh, epidemiology that he didn't have time to talk about. Um, so we have uh, three panelists here uh, who are going to first give us their vision for the future of wastewater monitoring. The first of these panelists is Dr. Aaron Best from Hope College. He's the Harrison and Mary uh, Vischer Professor of Genetics and co-director of the Global Water Research Institute at Hope College in Holland, Michigan and is the president and founder of Aquora Research and Consulting. Uh, I think he may tell you a little bit about that. He has over 20 years of experience in academia with recent crossover into industry, and he's been awarded over $15 million, million dollars in federal, I should say also state, and private grants in support of microbial genomics, ecology research, and application of research to public health problems stemming from water quality. Aaron, let's have your vision for the future of wastewater uh, epidemiology. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, um, for the introduction. And uh, thanks for having us on this panel. Um, it, this is a, a pretty broad subject. And kind of as I sit and reflect on what a future of wastewater-based epidemiology is, seems like a very broad and hard thing to describe. Um, <laughs> and so um, but I wanted to first sort of say that, you know, from the conference yesterday, it, it's very clear um, that Michigan is at the forefront of this kind of work, right? Certainly in the nation. And uh, the poster session was great. I really enjoyed seeing everybody's work, the work that I was able to get to during that time period. Um, and, and there's clear things that we've done over the past two years from basically starting at zero, right? Um, and ramping up something like this. And so I think from a reflection perspective, everybody in this room, and who's also not in this room but part of the network, should really be proud of themselves and proud of the work that, that's happened in a very acute, hard situation, right? And so congratulations on that. And, and thanks to the leadership um, at the state and federal and, and local levels for the vision, right, to be able to put something like that together and actually make it work. Um, that's really pretty amazing stuff. Um, and, and as I sit and reflect on what we did at Hope College, um, it was uh, very much born out of that necessity in the pandemic and thinking about how to get back to um, in-person classes, right, in the fall of 2020. And um, so as, as I approached wastewater-based epidemiology in our local area, um, the goal was never an academic goal. I am an academic fundamentally, right? Um, but but it, it was never an academic goal, and I think that also wasn't the goal really for a network like this. Um, and it, what the goal was, was to get to actionable information for decision makers at an institution, right? To be able to make daily decisions in an acute pandemic to keep their people safe, right? And to stay open. That was the goal. And so there were a few things that I thought about while with respect to WBE. Um, 
when we started to put our program together, and that was that it had to be inexpensive because the college was fronting the money for it. Uh, it had to be robust uh, to supply chain issues, and so we chose methods based on that. Um, it had to be rapid. That is, we wanted same-day results. So we received something in the lab in the morning. I wanted a result before 5 p.m. Because there was a meeting at 8 p.m. that night, right? Um, and it needed to be interpretable right, by college officials so that they could actually take actions and things like that. So those are the criteria that we were using to, to build the program that we put in place. And, and we had that program in place before this, this network sort of began. But uh, it's been really nice to be able to enter into this network Right, and begin to kind of merge uh, those different kinds of approaches um, and, and methodologies that fundamentally produce the same data types, right? And the information that's coming out of those data types is similar. Um, so that's kind of where we've been, but what, what's next? And to me, what's next is that it's clear that there's a need for sustainable and scalable wastewater-based epidemiology monitoring systems, right? There are potential vast applications. We heard about some of those yesterday. The examples out of the Netherlands are amazing, right? Um, and, uh, you know, they hit many sectors of society, public health at the community level, public health, well-being at a facility level, and that's not really something we've talked a lot about yet at this conference, I think. I think there's application into various industry sectors, any congregate living facility, um, especially those with high-risk populations, um, military applications, you know, anytime where you need readiness and you have people living in close quarters, right, I think that there are, are, are clear applications at those, at those groups. So what that means is that, that, that this touches multiple stakeholders, right, multiple stakeholders. And we talked about some of those. Some of those are public health departments. Right? In the CDC, as John was talking about just a few minutes ago, they, they are a stakeholder. They have expectations, right? And they have goals. The local public health departments have different goals, right? A long term care facility has different goals, right? So each of those levels of organizations where I think that WBBE can actually speak into and improve processes and improve human health, right? Um, have different needs. And so I think we need to be able to understand those needs. We need to be able to articulate those needs, right? Where is the value add for WBE for each of those stakeholders? We need to articulate those, identify them, refine them, and then educate people about what they are so that they can see that there's sort of a return on investment for putting funds and resources into a sustainable form of WBE. I don't think it can be only at the CDC or the federal level for funding. That's going to be a massive source of funding for a while. But for how long, right? And, and how do you actually make this sustainable and actually impactful at the different levels? Those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about with respect to WBE as a future, right? Um, and, and who, to put it this way and bluntly, who are the payers? <laughs> Who's going to pay for this? And in order for people to pay for something, they have to see value in it. And so I think that there's federal public level support and those kinds of things that are there. But I believe there are also large potential commercial applications for WBE that's not at the level of tech development or things like that, but it's at the level of implementation and of helping groups to understand how to use that information in an effective way in their environment, right? And so I think that's the challenge that sits before us, and that's the kind of work that networks like this can begin to aggregate on and build consensus around in certain of these sub-areas. And I think that's the kind of work that a network like this can lead on. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. nice. Thank you very much. And so thinking about all of the different types of levels and what their different needs are, and perhaps in the Q&A, we might discuss some additional areas. Uh, the next person um, who's going to give this introduction of the, their vision is Keith Sanders. Keith Sanders 
is the Ann Arbor Wastewater Treatment Services Unit Manager. Keith has over 25 years of experience in wastewater treatment. Keith is a member of the Water Environment Federation and the Michigan Water Environment Association. In addition, he is a proud graduate of Michigan State University. <laughs> so I guess I'm gonna leave the vision to you guys. I'm a wastewater guy. So when I think about this, there's three things that come to mind really. Helping you select the best location for your samples. We know what's on our sewer shed, right? So we can help you find the location that you want to get for a good sample. We also can ensure that you know about things that may interfere with your sample, industrial users, things like that. Um, we also can help you make sure you get good samples by talking with the lab. We may see something in the collection system, some lining project, they may use a chemical that will affect your sample. We may do something at the plant that may affect your sample. So, you know, it's just a, a lot of communication. And then giving you feedback on your dashboards, um, your academics, <laughs> and when we look at it and share it with uh, uh, people in, our, in the city or the community or even my operators and that, they're like, what, is, what does that mean? So we try to give a lot of feedback on, can you put a note here? Can you change that to this? Can you make a bar graph instead of that to try to help to get a, something that works for everybody? So that's, that's kind of our point of view. And um, we seem to give a lot of samples to a lot of different people kind of doing the same thing. So I guess if, you know, at some point you guys could get together and make, make, make it a little easier for us. I mean, I guess some of our samples, we, we give them to Marissa. And then they also go to Wastewater Scan. So they both go to you guys at NWSS. So, I mean, we got some QAQC at all kind of levels on our samples. So <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. But uh, that's really from our perspective. Thank yeah. you very much, Keith. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. I'll just add or uh, uh, say something additional about your presentation. Perhaps someone later will ask the question. Um, if you had a vision for what we're not measuring now oh, in wastewater, yeah. that the wastewater utility would really like to know, that's Careful something we'd like for. to know. <laughs> what? Careful what you wish for. It then becomes a becomes a mandated thing that's unfunded that I have to talk to my ratepayers about. So <laughs> it's better that you keep it out. I, I think we'll have a further discussion about that. Yes. Okay. And the third person on our panel, Marissa Eisenberg. Marissa Eisenberg is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and in the Department of Mathematics. Her research revolves around mathematical epidemiology and focuses on identifying and uh, estimating parameters to use in modeling disease dynamics. Her group builds multi-scale models of infectious disease, um, not just SARS-CoV-2, but HPV, cholera, and in other environmentally driven diseases. And she's also had a large part in the design of a communication dashboard uh, put out by the University of Michigan. She works jointly on several projects related to wastewater monitoring for a range of pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2. And what is your views, vision for the future of Michigan and wastewater epidemiology? Yeah, yeah so I think the, one of the things we've heard again and again yesterday and today is that for, for the future of wastewater to be what I think we all sort of hope it to be, we have to get the wastewater monitoring system to a point where it can be integrated, interpretable, and actionable, which, I mean, we heard from Aaron just now, you know, I think everyone has kind of been talking about this. Um, but to say a little bit more about sort of what I mean by that, so integrated meaning that wastewater monitoring is a part of sort of the standard public health toolkit that we are used to looking at it, that it's integrated from the treatment plant to the lab to local, state, public health, that or other stakeholders. I think it's a really important point that you know that includes long-term care facilities includes a lot of different people so integrated from 
with like regular triangulation across the different data streams that we have. You know, we should be used to and in a magical future world, we're all used to and, and regularly look at wastewater alongside everything else. So it's a piece, a part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think interpretable is one of the things, that's something that has come up again and again as well. For us to really have that integration, we have to have understandable metrics and visualization that can answer public health questions about the patterns and trends of disease and understandable and interpretable metrics and visualization again is going to mean something different for different stakeholders different groups right and so I think that's something that we're going to need to be working on you know even just thinking about like as Aaron sort of pointed out the you know if you're a if you're a single institution in one local area versus if you're looking at multiple sewer sheds and trying to understand what's happening in your region or your state you know those are very different kinds of questions and what the interpretable metrics are going to be might be different for those different things um, and then lastly of course the real goal is that we want to improve public health right and so it has to be actionable. We have to have something that you can take this information and do something with it, right? And so I think that is going to inform how we think about how we look at the data. It's also going to inform, you know, how we think about what pathogen targets, as we heard in the keynote this morning, you know, um, how we decide which pathogen targets to be paying attention to. And so I guess overall, for, for getting us to integrated, interpretable, and actionable, we have to build wastewater monitoring as a sort of standard tool in public health for a wide range of pathogens, and, and hopefully in a way that's sort of flexible, something that's equitable and representative. You know, we really need to be thinking about the unsewered populations and, you know, those kinds of issues too. Timely and sustainable, something that, you know, as you pointed out, if there's an unfunded mandate, that's not really sustainable, right? We have to, it has to be, it means resources. We have to actually, you know, be, so anyway, so with established validated approaches, and then if we go to the next slide, I think there are a lot of questions for how we actually get ourselves to that place. So I know this is like a panel, we're supposed to be answering questions, but instead I'm going to pose a bunch of questions to you all, which hopefully we can sort of think about, which are, you know, we, there's a lot of open questions about how we validate and compare wastewater data with other data sources, particularly in situations where for many pathogens, we don't have great epidemiological data. There's a lot of under ascertainment. And so then there's no gold standard. So what, how do we do that comparison in those situations? You know, what's the right frequency or spatial scale to mod monitor, which is going to depend on the pathogen. It's also going to depend on the needs and which stakeholders are involved. A, you know, a hospital might have a different spatial scale that they're interested in than the state of Michigan, right? And so, um, so I think those are going to be things we're going to have to kind of work through. Um, anyway, there's a pile of them up there. Lots and lots more I'm sure we'll talk about, but I think that's kind of where I envision the future. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so one of the questions that was suggested to me that I should ask the panel is what challenges do you have to the audience as to what they should be doing in the future? So you've already begun that. <laughs> but the, the question that we're going to go on to, and this is for the panel from me, and then we'll open it up to the audience, is and it's a bit different from your vision. What do you see as the greatest opportunities in the future? And what would it take to make that happen? We all, we all know part of the answer to that is coming from Susan Peters and MDHHS. <laughs> and beyond that, from the CDC and the federal government. But uh, what do you see as the greatest opportunities in the future, and what would it take to make that happen? Mm. It, it seems like uh, part of that's happened, right? You've got a lot of people together thinking about creating networks and how to get things done so if something else pops up, there you go. So it seems to me like we're, we're on the pathway there. It's just keep building on that. And the other thing is, you know, when you get a... Can, can I interrupt yeah, for a second? How do you sustain that? We've heard uh, a few cases where things started because there was a pandemic and yeah. we got together. And That's then the million dollar question, off. right? It's, it's how to get that funding, how to get that support and to keep it going. One of the other things from my perspective is it happened when the Ebola came out. Um, we're in Ann Arbor, big hospital. They have some in the wastewater because they were sampling. That really trips up my staff. 
we're handling wastewater, treating it to put it back in the river, you know, all of a sudden somebody comes out and says, oh, we found this. Well, what does it mean for the people that are in that sanitary sewer collection system? What does it mean for the wastewater employees? I mean, that, or for the public if there's an overflow. You know, you, you really need to have your message prepared before you just throw out there, hey, we found this, right? So that's one thing I would, I would throw out there. So. Somebody else want to talk about the um, opportunities and what would it take to make yeah. that happen? I mean, so I guess opportunity-wise, I think like the, the, the biggest thing that we all want to have happen is that we, you know, we, are, we see tangible improvements to public health because of the kinds of data that we're collecting. And I think um, in terms of what it would take to make that happen, I think, we're, like you said, we're on the path to that kind of thing. Wastewater is becoming increasingly used in decision-making. You know, I think that's helping a lot of different things. I think we're going to have to kind of, like, like we, as it's, I think Susan said this, a few people have said this, we built the plane while we were flying it, and now we've got to, like, now I'm changing metaphors, we have to put the foundation under the house that we already <laughs> built, right? But, you know, and so, uh, so I think that's something that we're going to have to kind of figure out. I mean, you know, things like what you're mentioning, I think there's great opportunity in monitoring for emerging infectious diseases, but it's going to flip people out if they know that that's in the wastewater, right? And yeah. so, yeah, exactly. So we have to have thought about, like, is it, is there an infection risk from, you know, like all of those kinds of things. We got to, you know, that's the groundwork that we have to now do. Yeah. yeah. So I would say in your analogy about the, uh, the plane, um, <laughs> perhaps we're in uh, a Star Wars or Star Trek. There we go. <laughs> and we need now to go into hyperdrive. There we go. <laughs> yeah. If only the power source is sufficient. Um, Another question, uh, would you, you want to add? Yeah, I, I was just going to add in a little bit that I think that there's an opportunity here to bring together different groups that just don't talk to each other um, and that this is, a, this is a great nucleus for that. And there are many examples and disciplines where this can happen, right? But this is one that has, I think, clear outcomes is bringing together you know, public and private sectors uh, different regulatory issues, different thinking about equity, um, way, social issues, a, a lot of different areas that can come together. And I, I would, I guess, characterize it as there's room at the table for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge is to ensure that the, the stakeholders and the people who are at the table or trying to come to that table are actually included. Um, th their voices can be heard, and then understanding how those different disciplines and areas actually interact and communicate. And I think some of the things, like we're seeing examples from like, uh, from Anna yesterday on WEF, you know, pulling together a lot of the utilities and understanding what their challenges are and things like that. APHL doing a similar thing through the CDC news program. Those kinds of activities are, are absolutely required. The, the things that I, I think are a, a real challenge from a sustainability perspective then become what are the barriers inside our existing systems that keep us from actually doing those things mm -hmm. and keep us from actually funding those things, right? Uh, so we just heard from John during his talk that, oh, yeah, that's not part of what we do at CDC. You know, we can't fund research, right? Well, okay, so that's NIH's deal. Well, okay, what are those barriers? Why, why can that not be a surmountable thing, right? And so, some, and, and this is not just specific to WBE, but I do think that that WBE approach gives us an opportunity to really nuclear around, nucleate around ideas to get around those things and to collaborate at a scale that, that can actually have lasting impact. Yeah. So. The next question is, what advice or challenge do you have to the audience um, or recommendations um, do you have for this field to move forward? Mm. Uh, it's a little bit like the opportunities question, but is there a specific challenge perhaps for people who aren't working in your environment? You might be talking to the public health sector or the utility sector or um, and this, I think, perhaps is not represented at our conference here, the community at large, except I think there's a reporter in the audience somewhere. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> what challenge do you have? What, what recommendations or challenges would you 
put on the audience. Anybody want to talk to that? That feels, I feel, I feel like we're give, giving the audience a to-do list. I don't know. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. And they're going to give us a to-do list good. next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess one thing I think, like for this audience, I know we have, this is like not exactly the, the, we have a lot of academics in this audience and we have uh, public health folks who have been, we've had a lot of conversation over the last day and a half or whatever about wrangling between research and public health as our, you know, sort of surveillance, like surveillance and, and, and research. And I, I feel like there, like one challenge that, that Eh, it's not exactly a challenge, whatever, an opportunity, let's say it that way, um, is that I think actually those two things can work really quite well together if it's done right, like in the, in the sense that being close to the public health purpose and a part of the surveillance system means you are incredibly close to all these questions and data that you wouldn't necessarily have or see otherwise. And so maybe this is a to-do list for academia more than anything else, but like I think we should try and shift ourselves to see the usefulness and be are at more useful, I don't know, whatever. Do you, you get where I'm going with this? This is not well articulated. <laughs> but I guess the, the point is that, is that like being close to the, to the public health surveillance piece of it can actually be a huge opportunity for the research. Even if the funding can't fund the research side of it, it's an engine that can drive our research in a way that nothing else can. And it's super awesome when it works out. So I think we can align ourselves better that way. Yeah. Anybody else? out of your silo and, and more stakeholders, Yeah, right? exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. We get questions from, from you guys, from, you know what I mean, from our local health department stakeholders who come to our meetings that make us think about things that we wouldn't otherwise think about. And then it's actually useful for someone to do something, which is great, so yeah. you know, yeah. And that's, and the <laughs> meetings are, are again, you, you talk about the challenges. It's, I think those meetings that we have are weekly for a while or biweekly or whatever, where we all have a chance to look at the data, they go over what they're doing, what they're thinking, and give us a chance to give them feedback, which I think helps drive everyone to a better solution. Yeah. So it's just that public out, outreach and stakeholder commitment for communication. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think Irene Zagararaki yeah. said it yesterday with the way that she's been meeting on a regular basis with her stakeholders. and. You know, you think you have the ideas, but it's amazing how brainstorming actually works. <laughs> Things come up. Why didn't I think of that before? And, and the other people as well. Um, so now we're, we're going to open this um, to the general audience. I just wanted to say one more thing. I'll try not to take too much time on this. As I was thinking about moderating this panel, on the future of wastewater epidemiology, I was thinking about the future what? Future pathogens, future techniques, future non-pathogenic. I've got a list of 15 different future things that we might be thinking about. The future of ethical thinking and reasoning that we have to take into account. I'm sure there's a variety of different areas that we haven't even touched on yet. And We'd like the questions from you to the panel or to the audience um, about how we can best move wastewater epidemiology into the future that you would like to see. I see questions already, people at the microphone already, so let's move on. All right. Hello, my name is Sophia Hania Yusuf. Ooh, this is outgoing. Okay, um, I am a student assistant with Dr. Ram, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in the RAM lab, and um, my role in the citywide uh, monitoring of COVID-19 waste uh, for in the wastewater um, has been mostly with outreach. So, as someone who majored in public health and has um, been focusing a lot more on like obviously like community outreach and a uh, advocacy. I think like this this challenge that I have when I am talking to people about wastewater monitoring is they're like, cool, how's this going <laughs> to affect me in any way? Um, or either that or they're like a little spooked out. So I think uh, uh, spooked out, they're like, huh? Talk into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. They're a little spooked out as to why um, 
or how we can find such things. And they're like, oh, like Dr. Ram said, there's a lot of ethical implications. So I think my question is, is that what do you see for the future of advocacy, especially in a public health role? Because I see so many new things popping up uh, and I'm very excited for the future of wastewater. So cool. That's awesome. I don't know. You want to go first? It doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Risa. I, yeah, whoever wants. Oh, it. go ahead. Yeah. This is all your. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so I guess um, I, I think so. I think there's like the <laughs> pandemic has totally changed the way that the public health views, or pardon me, that the public views public health and and their awareness. I mean, you know, we in public health we've been so used to for so long being, and probably I'm, like everybody in the wastewater field in general, right, being totally invisible to the public at large. And now all of a sudden, so I think there's huge opportunities for us to help the public get to know public health and get to know wastewater-based epidemi epidemiology as a field. Um, I think there are also enormous pitfalls that we have to navigate around. I mean, the like big brother is watching you poop vibe is like not a thing that we want to have, you know what I mean, right? So uh, so I think that's something that we're going to, sorry, that was a weird, it's been all weird analogies today. But anyway, so so I think, I think that's something that we're gonna have to wrangle with, right? And so we're gonna have to be very, it is a little bit of a wild west in terms of all the things that we can test for right now. And so we're gonna have to really be thinking a lot about how we communicate with the public and also how we're careful about the next steps that as a wastewater monitoring system you know we're taking so that you know we avoid that there are real you know as we've been talking about legal ethical you know issues that we have to be very careful to navigate yeah yeah I would I would add that um, you know what do you do with wastewater information and 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 I think that there's still some struggle within the realm of experts Right, about what you do with that. And so how do you communicate that well to a public yeah. right? when you yourself don't quite know yeah. what to do with it? So I think there's work inside a network like this to, to set those things out and to understand the limitations. And from a public health perspective, the interactions that we've had with our local health departments on the west side of the state, it, they're very fruitful and they're good discussions, but there are some just real limitations as to what one can do as a public health official, right? In terms of what you communicate, and then what the public responds to, and how they, you know, how they perceive those things. Um, you know, so I, I think we need to understand all all of those parameters, kind of around around that type of communication, and it's it's really emergent, right? And so we have to. Edu there's a huge education piece that just has to happen. And you know, it can't happen quickly and it can't happen in a pandemic. It has yeah. to happen you know, over time and over a sustained period. And yeah. I think, I, so I love, yeah, I totally agree. I think also like related to that is that part of what has happened in the pandemic, oh sorry, talk towards the mic, yes. <laughs> uh, part of what's happened in the pandemic is that we've been doing science live in the public eye, which means you, know, you see an uptick in a trend, does that mean something or is that just part of the regular variability? In many cases, that was happening on Twitter and we didn't know yet, right? And so uh, I think that is also gonna be one of the challenges that we are gonna have to wrangle with is how to communicate uncertainty well and how to communicate uncertainty without undermining trust in science, right? And so that, I think, is something we're going to have to keep wrangling with. Yeah. But, but just to add that when we talk about the public, we're, yeah. we're meaning many different things. The public yeah. might mean the people in the neighborhood that you're sampling. But it might be the public is business if you're business to business. And what you need to explain at the business level, and I thought maybe you might say that, business to business. It's also the public is our representatives in Congress and in the state legislatures. And our public are also the administrators at the top, even as high as the president. Um, let's uh, go on to the next question. Thanks. Hi, I'm David Inman with Aquasite once again. Um, we are an intelligent software provider that's focused on pulling in all this data and trying to get the data into the hands of these decision makers. Those, as you just mentioned, that could be public, those could be utilities, um, all these different types of people. One of the things that we found to help solve this problem, not just in a COVID sphere, but in any time, any problem where, uh, where this is being solved, is to provide a common platform that each person from their own angle 
whether it's the operators at the plant, the health department logging in, the laboratory interacting with the data, if they have the common same set of screens, same set of numbers that everyone's looking at and they can understand from their own lens, that helps people better understand what's going on and not just within one project, but when the scope broadens and you have multiple communities that start comparing how is our community doing next to the community that's 20 miles away or across the state. You can have different health departments entirely that are looking at their own sets of data, but they have the same sets of information in front of them. The same dashboards, the same layout, it becomes a single source of truth. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we found has been instrumental really in solving multiple problems, whether it's this type of wastewater platform or other types of um, like compliance data or optimizational data. So I just want to offer as a solution provider and as others, we've already built these technologies that exist and being able to bring in the data that lives in these different discrete systems into a combined platform can streamline that process. Thanks. So um, I know that wasn't a question to the panel necessarily, but you might want to comment on it. I think all of you have been involved in putting data out for the public. I'm not sure about the, the treatment facility, uh, the measurement. We have dashboards. We have dashboards on dashboards. all Dashboards, yeah. Do you want to comment on, on how that's used or what your audience is, or do you want to put that in terms of a question? No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, though, right, to have a dashboard that looks the same, because I have a dashboard from WaterScan. I get a dashboard from these guys, <laughs> and now I saw his dashboard today. Where, which one do you go to? And it, I guess it depends on what you're looking for or all that. So it might be nice to get one dashboard that has all the data that everyone could put data to. It might make that a little simpler for the public. So I, I, I see the value in that yeah. as someone that is looking at my data in three different places. Yeah, I, I think that um, the dashboards that are clear communicate fundamental easy to understand pieces of information that are taking super complex information, right, and making and boiling it down to something that whoever that stakeholder is can understand, right, is, is very important. I, I don't know that I would subscribe to the view that a single one-stop shop dashboard would ever actually do that. I think there has to be tailoring and customization for those kinds of things to the audience that you're actually speaking to at the time. And that includes not just disseminating that information in a visual way, but that also includes linking that to the actions that they could likely take based on condition X, Y, or Z, whatever that is. Um, and, and I think those pieces aren't in place and we don't actually understand what those actions are. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of work that has to be done in that realm. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we should be thinking about standardization on is, in fact, data analysis and data analysis approaches and what, what those metrics are. But how you visualize those doesn't have to be standardized. Um, and, and we talk a lot about, as a group here, uh, all the academics here, we're really good at thinking about method standardization and method optim optimization and those kinds of things. And that actually might not be where we want to focus. <laughs> we really might want to focus on being able to take in multiple data types that are basically giving you the same information, but on the data side, you're actually standardizing and giving out consistent information. You can handle variability. Because if we actually expanded this to be a national system with multiple players inputting data into that system, there's no way that's standardized from a methodology perspective. It just, it, that, that, to me, that's a red herring. And I understand as an <laughs> academic, right, that I understand all that, right? But what I'm trying to think about is, is what is it at the end point from a decision maker's perspective, what do they actually need, right? And how much uncertainty can you actually handle getting to that point? And I think it's quite a bit. Um, and, and so I think those are kind of discussions that need to be had um, that, that we can potentially focus around, you know, kind of going forward as well. And I think building our way to whatever, you know, I, I think a dashboard is a start, but you have to be talking. You have, like, you know, this is a new data stream. People aren't as familiar with how to use and interpret it. I think we have to be also talking with people and, and you know, like, yeah. this, yeah. the people who are going to use this to make decisions, like, there will be, like, a, a, 
a, a phase where it, it's hard to do that in a vacuum and you have to yeah. be talking about it together. I've got so much to say about that, but we have to give the <laughs> audience. <laughs> Let's have the next. Thanks. No, no, Thanks. There's a, a lot. I'm sure a lot of people have to, something to say. Is standardization better or let multiple flowers bloom? But yeah, yeah. next. All right. I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, my name is Dave Schlag. One of the uh, things that became obvious to me over the last couple of days is we need samples to have data to communicate to the, to the public. And the group I think that hasn't really been talked about too much here are the operators. Because the, the first set of samples we're gonna probably get are gonna be coming from a wastewater utility. Mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna have their auto sampler. But I think uh, uh, the, we have to win the hearts and minds of the operators at the plant. Uh, educate them on how to collect the samples, the importance of sample you know, sample handling. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the things we could do moving forward, and maybe CDC, maybe uh, WEF could, could help, is part of operator education, you know, so I, I'm sure many of you have been involved, you know, through AWWA or, or uh, ASCE and operator training. So if we can kind of win the hearts and the minds of the operators, I think moving forward, that will really facilitate a lot of these other, I mean, we need the samples, we need them to be collected properly, we need them in a timely manner. So I think maybe part of uh, operator training, operator CECs, you know, something along those lines, and I think that would be something that should be promoted as operator, um, you know, continuing education. Thank Keith, you. would you like to comment on that? Uh, if you want to win the hearts and minds, start with UPS and FedEx. I was about... <laughs> I was, at a, I was at a kit's for about a week and a half. It was sitting in California, just sitting there, sitting there, and what they ended up doing was just created another order and sent it to me. I think the first order is still in California. So um, my operators are good at taking samples. I tell them we need to take a sample. These guys tell me where they want it from. We talk about how they want it taken. If we get it taken, we get it in our fridge or however they want it stored or preserved. Um, so I mean, I think that is more of that communication from what you need to the plants. And I think that is best done if you want to win over an operator is just come to the plant and have a discussion and go out with them to the site where you want the sample taken and show them what you want in your interest and then tell them you'll give them data back. They'll be more than happy to help. What they don't like is added work and they never see the data come back, right? Oh, I'm taking 20 extra samples. Where does this stuff go? What are you doing with it all? So when you come back to them and say, look, this is what we did with the samples you gave us, and show them the charts and graphs, they are definitely willing to help. And, but again, they're always looking for CECs, so if you can incorporate that into their training, a continuing education credit for their licensing, if you can incorporate that, I mean, it's great. It gives them an, another tool in their toolbox. I think they would be more than happy for that. But yeah, right now, I think for us, our biggest sample is, is U of M comes, they have a courier that gets there, so we, and they're real close, but for the Verily that we're doing, it's, it's FedEx. I mean, they just are kind of in their own world, so if you could talk to them and win their hearts, that'd be great. <laughs> this is also a matter of ethics. You get something from somebody, you need to give back. Yeah. If you're out in the community and you're taking the community's data and you're using that, for the public health, or perhaps to promote your own career, because it's also part of that. What is the community getting back, and do they see that they're getting that back? And in the case of the wastewater utility, those workers are saying, oh, we gotta go out and pull that manhole cover again. Why? <laughs> so getting that information back, showing that it really had some beneficial effect mm -hmm. with uncertainty allowed is, is probably really important. Next question. Hello, I'm Rachel Dodek. I'm an epidemiologist with the Detroit Health Department. I was wondering if anybody could speak on um, the potential of implementing influenza and RSV wastewater monitoring at the local jurisdiction level as far as if there's anything's in the works currently in the works, and if there's anything we local health department should be looking out for in the future, 
And if so, could we possibly expect to see it at the level we reached with SARS-CoV-2? Yeah. So, so yeah. there's a, there's a, a company called Verily that's helping for wastewater scan. It is, I think, Stanford and Emory uh, universities, Alley and... Uh, yeah, I guess, yes. Yeah, so they're, they have a number of 350, so they're still looking for some more wastewater plants. So if you can get, <laughs> if you can get GLWA to sign up, they will come and take a sample, and they're looking at all those things you said plus more. Yeah. So if you can get there before they hit their cap of 350 and get GLWA to send those samples in, you'll be able to get all that plus. And right, because yeah. that's what we get. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think I think like more and more of the sites in this room, like we're measuring influenza, RSV, a bunch of other different things, um, you know. And and so I think I think we are starting to expand into those areas. I do think for SARS-CoV-2, there was like a it was a you know at the beginning of the pandemic, there was there was a the information sharing about methods and all that was incredibly fast and people were very willing to you know so I think there's some method logical stuff that is going to have to get ironed out for other pathogen targets as we continue to add them. But I also do think, you know, I, I mean, we heard that from news that there are, you know, it's happening. We're going to see a bunch more pathogen. So I think we are growing that direction. I think we will soon have, you know, I think many of us are measuring those things already, putting them out to dashboards, but it is to, I don't know where he ended up, but to, like, it's not all integrated into one, into a common dashboard, you know, so like the, the, the sweep dashboard and the news stuff don't have, you know, I think it has MPOX also, but it, you know, but all those targets aren't in those places yet, but I think it's coming. I think it's only a matter of time before that's a thing. Yeah. I, I think there's an opportunity also for collaboration there with health departments that do want that, right? Um, also with the methodological development, um, you know, COVID was a very unique situation with respect to case counts and the comprehensiveness with which we had that information. Um, and, and so I do think that for some of these things to have a similar level of confidence and say either your ability to predict this is, you know, the percent of population that has whatever um, on these sub subsets of diseases that having the communication lines for your reportable diseases, getting that back to the academic lab methodological piece, um, as well as the wastewater side to, to bring those models together, I, I think is also important. So I think there's a lot of opportunity potentially in the near term for those kinds of activities and potential ways to pay for things. Yeah. Um, but then it still begs the question of sustainability. So. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I think it would be really useful, um, the site that you mentioned or company, Verily, yeah. and the fact that there are laboratories um, in Michigan that are, and this is a Michigan meeting, uh, that are already doing some of these, it would be really useful if at the next Minet meeting we could plan to gather some data yeah. on what other targets people are already using, what is, do they have a technique established, or are they still doing their controls yeah. establishing it. Now that's for different targets. That might also apply for different dashboards. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a dashboard. I don't think it's as well developed as your dashboard. Is it transferable? Right, right. I yeah. mean, and even if, I don't know, now I'm being a pest, but like, could <laughs> MDHHS even put links to some of these dashboards that have other targets, you know what I mean? And then, you know, at least there's like one place you can go to find all the, I don't know, you know, whatever. I'm just brainstorming. It's but. those silos, right? Yeah, everyone's exactly. in their own. Everyone's exactly. in their own silo, and you don't know what's out there exactly. unless you get somebody to break out and reach out to everybody. Exactly. Because we didn't know until they, they came to us. And it's like, oh, OK, aren't you them? And no, we're a little different. So you want a sample? Sure, have a sample. <laughs> so this is in the category of what do we need to move forward? Yeah, yeah. I see another question. OK, it's uh, Tran Wuxi from University of Michigan. So one of the problems with professors is really we are always thinking, we always have something to say whether it's right or not. <laughs> so I say anyway. Um, so I think it's uh, it's. We cannot really emphasize enough how much the utility people are doing to help the public health, to protect mm -hmm. public health. If you look at this history, historically, the wastewater treatment surely improved our life expectancy, improved our public health tremendously. There's no, I mean, compared to all the other countries, we can see that. So there's no, I mean, we can really have to emphasize that. I really appreciate all these utility people to, to work to protect public health. So, when we do the wastewater-based epidemiology, we always collect the influence samples. Mm. There's no way you can control what's coming into the plant. 
for the utility people. But one thing you can do, right, you can control how, what is coming out, what's the influence. So um, for the West based epidemiology, when we look at the influence data, if you look hard enough, you probably find anything you want to find in the West world, right? <laughs> so if you, if you visit the West Western plant, you probably see that anything you want to find, you will find there. So, but you can control what can come out from the plant. So it's a comment also our recommendation is really when we collect the samples, we can collect influence samples, but we can also collect influence samples mm -hmm. so that you can compare to see how much you removed yeah. uh, from the process. And, and that gives the confidence to the public, you know, what you are doing really to remove the contaminants. Whether it's, I mean, there's some, a lot of scientific questions we ask whether it's there, why, I mean, whether it's infectivity, but even just look at the numbers, you will probably see dramatic change in that. Sure. So yeah. we do the SARS-CoV-2, when we collect the influence samples, yes, we see very high numbers, but we cannot really detect in the effluent numbers. So that's really kind of information probably can add to the West World based epidemiology um, for, for the purpose of public commu communication. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you need more samples. <laughs> there we go. So they're going to ask for more samples. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll just add. I need uh, another fridge. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Um, M.D. Alamine, who works in my laboratory, for his PhD, he's a postdoc, for his PhD, he studied the comparison between influent oh, and nice. effluent at sites in Japan. Oh, so uh, it, it's been studied by a number of people, um, but very important. And then you're getting into the future of wastewater epidemiology and how it affects the environment. Because some things, especially emergent contaminants, get through your yeah. system. Right. Our plant is only designed to, to treat right. so many things, right? And right. if you want to add things, then you need to know what you're trying to add to get re treatment on, and then what is the scalable mm -hmm. method to do that? Uh, you know, we're flowing 18 million gallons a day. When PFAS come out, there was people that could treat like a liter a day mm -hmm. or yeah. a couple mils a minute. That's not really scalable at, at our levels, right, for a wastewater treatment plant. So I think that helps drive business to determine what they want to put their R&D in mm -hmm. to create that next great treatment option to put on these wastewater treatment plants or water plants to clean it up. Totally. So, yeah, yeah so, for sure. So that's part of the future. Some people will be looking at that effluent and if there are huge concerns about a particular thing like those PFOSs, uh, yeah, there might be a future regulation, but it is to protect the public health. Oh, yeah, yeah here. I, I had one question and maybe one suggestion. So my question is, um, we haven't discussed much about like the legal and ethical framework that we would need to put into place to put this uh, wide scale, I think Jeff can speak to that a lot about the legal and ethical framework that needs to go into place when dealing with this uh, wastewater which contains human, uh, you know, like if I go to the doctor and he takes my stool, that's under HIPAA regulations <laughs> and he can't disclose what's in there. So this is probably something that needs to be done eventually. And this, the suggestion I had was I was thinking what sort of surveillance monitoring exists. And I thought about the US Department of Agriculture. They have a good surveillance monitoring for pests. You know, they have it all worked out um, at the port of entries. You have staff that is uh, checking all these bugs that might uh, impact the country. Maybe. Uh, wastewater treatment plants are our port of entry there you would have this is way in the future when this thing might be completely organized you know everyone's happy no one cares about dashboards anymore no one's looking to see if the mealy bug came in yesterday or if the parasitic wasp came in you know all that is handled by the government and we are fine with it so that that was just uh, what I, I was thinking about does anybody want to comment about agricultural wastewater? I, I guess I'll just say I, I think that that's something we can't ignore. It, it, it's one of those sectors. And there's so much waste that comes out of, of large-scale farming and, and those kinds of things. They have their own issues with infectious disease, 
right, for their flocks or their animals or whatever they're, they're working with. Um, and so I think there's a huge opportunity there for wastewater monitoring, even just for that industry, let alone the example we heard yesterday of thinking about, well, what is that transition of a natural population from avian flu mm -hmm. to agricultural versions of that to interaction with human to human mm -hmm. populations, right? So I think there's multiple ways that agriculture plays a role. We have time for just a couple more All questions right. and then a summing up. All and right. I see um, Shannon Briggs. Yeah. I'm Shannon Briggs from Eagle, and I work in surface water, but we also have a lot of staff that work in wastewater. Uh, one of the things I want to say is thank you for everybody who figured out that the coronavirus, when it was in the fecal shedding, it was not as infectious as the respiratory. Because we shared that information with all of our wastewater treatment operators to tell them it's okay. You know, as much as we understand this new virus, it's not, once it's in this feces, it's not gonna be as bad. So that was a very big thing that was a big help. So it made me realize, when you're working with all these different pathogens, figure them out before you start measuring them mm -hmm. because you need to own your results. So, oh, yay, Let, let's say I've found this new icky, ooh, gross pathogen that's going to kill everybody. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, that's not helpful. Um, so please do your no basic homework today. about yeah. the things that you're studying and trying to find all these viruses, know their infectivity, all those different things. And then I'd like to also say um, most of us here are coming from public health and research, we want to leverage. What I've learned is when you leverage, I help you, you help me, we got a win-win. And in some places we can get more than that. So how do we, all of us in the room, how do we help wastewater? Where do we go to learn what do you need? How do you need it? What, what are you, where do we find more about what, how you need things? Mm. That's, that's what I would like to know. I guess come out to the plant. <laughs> we always give tours. You'd be surprised the amount of people that come out and say, wow, I had no idea that's where it went when I hit that toilet. I had no idea that's where, when it left my house, that's where it went, or how it got here, or that you were here, or wow, you treat a lot of water. You do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's coming it truly up. is. And that's the future, too. <laughs> Yeah, still yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Another question. Yes. Uh, Quick. We only have about Rebecca three I, minutes. Michigan State yeah. University. I see a lot of early career scientists in the room. So, how do we get information that goes from our public health utilities, our government, to administration of academia that helps prevent their efforts in helping the public uh, health without being penalized in their career advancement. Mm -hmm. I, there's that whole publisher parish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we help accelerate both the public health without <clears throat> penalizing our students, our young uh, early faculty? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a this is a really good yeah. question. I, I I think like so I think there are there are a lot of so on the one hand, it is a challenge. Like our, our junior faculty, our students, they need publications to be able to move forward with their careers. I think though that there are a lot of ways that this work can actually accelerate their careers and, and you know, the, the interdisciplinary collaborations that they build here will give them unique skills that help them find their next job. I mean, actually it's funny, we were just talking yesterday about how one of the cool things about Michigan and the, the, the sewer network in Michigan is how much workforce stuff has happened as a result. You know, students have bopped around between labs, they've gone on to CDC, medical school, all other industry, all different kinds of things with this very distinct set of knowledge and skills that is like, you wouldn't find such an interdisciplinary kind of training in most other situations. So I think we have to capitalize on those pieces of it and I think you know, publications, I mean, whatever, I feel like I've poo-pooed publications a lot on this panel, but they are important, right? That's how we keep track of the scientific record and how we share our findings with the rest of, you know, so it's not like that stuff has to be prioritized too. We have to like walk and chew gum at the same time, I think, but yeah. yeah. So we have time, barely, for about 30 seconds, each oh. person to sum up <laughs> the take-home lesson oh for the audience. Keith, then Marissa, and then Aaron. <laughs> I guess collaborate and communicate. I love it. I 
I, th I agree. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's your answer. Yeah. All right, sweet. Uh, yeah, collaborate and communicate. And uh, translate from information to action to each group that you're trying to get to. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that about wraps it up. I think we have a bright future um, and a brown future. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we can really help the public health in the work that we do. So thank you. <laughs>